And now for the final element of the day, we'll have keynotes from two of our MBA students. So the first is Vitor Kneip, and the other is Shruti Vijayakumar. Welcome. <laughs> Save the best for last. Um, it's, uh, it's lovely to spend this time and, and be in the space with you. I'm very grateful and very honored. Um, I wanted to start with a quick story. So my first job uh, coming out of undergrad was working in management consulting. My parents were super proud, these wonderful traditional Indian parents. I was financially independent. I had a stable job with a good firm. They were happy. My friends, they were impressed as well when they saw the fine dining, the fancy hotels, the constant travel. And even me, I was pretty stoked to see my bank balance finally in the positives and growing steadily. By many measures of society, I had a successful start to my career. The reality, however, for me, was very different. Most of my days would start at 8 a.m., go till 10 p.m., with little time for friends or hobbies outside of work. My health struggled. I was constantly eating out, hardly exercising, always feeling a little bit tired, a little bit sleep deprived kind of like the MBA in some ways. Um, but the worst part was probably the mental health. They say consultants are insecure overachievers, and I can definitely agree to the insecure part. Over the course of two years, I noticed myself become more worried about how people were perceiving me, more conscious of whether I was playing the game properly, building the right relationships. How was I performing relative to others? I saw myself becoming someone I didn't want to become. And all of this culminated and me working my first 24-hour day. It was ridiculous. And at this point, I finally started questioning, is this really what I want? Many of us are so busy climbing this ladder that we get to the top, only then to realize that the ladder was leaning against the wrong building all along. No, I wasn't at the top of the ladder by any means, but I certainly realized I was unconsciously climbing this ladder. Society has its own measures of success its own definitions, and the structures, the cultures, the systems, the incentives we live by are all geared toward pushing us to climb this default ladder up, this default building of success, whatever that's meant to be. So I've been questioning, what is the societal measure of success? And I asked our trusty friend Google. I Googled most successful people in the world, and the first hit was about the eight most wealthiest people in our world who incidentally own as much wealth as the bottom 50%. I then Googled most successful company, and I got to read about the most inspiring company in the world, Walmart, and their 500, almost 500 billion revenue. I then Googled most successful economy, and this time got to read about our world-leading country, the United States, with their whopping, I think, 17, billion tri 17 trillion GDP, whatever that is. The reality is that our societal measures of success all revolve around accumulating wealth, around producing, consuming, having more stuff with little regard to the implications this might have on ourselves, our health, our families, our communities, our environment at large. The systems are geared toward pushing us climb this default ladder of success. As we heard from Ali this morning, incentives drive beliefs and beliefs drive behavior. It's easy to be pushed up this default measure of success. It's easy to choose a business school with a higher ranking or a job with a higher pay. It's easy to stay where you are than have a hard conversation about leaving. It's easier to buy into fast fashion than invest in stuff that lasts, given it's not fashionable anymore. It's easier to pursue short-term profits for shareholders when you're measured quarterly on the stock market than consider long-term value for multiple stakeholders. It's easier to stick with the default, to continue with the path we're on. Now, for me, leaving consulting was hard. I left uh, this comfortable life and moved to India. I joined a tiny education startup, eager to connect with my roots and work on some education challenges. The fancy high-rise corporate buildings were replaced by shanty public schools. The five-star meals were replaced by simple home-cooked dinners. What I earned in a month was now what I earned in a year. I remember sitting down with my dad before I left, and we were having this chat. It was quite hard, and he said, look, Shruti, what are you doing with your life? Don't you realize how hard your mum and I worked to bring you to New Zealand for better opportunity? Why are you taking a step backwards? I arrived in India, and I remember, I think it was the first or second meal, I was in Mumbai sitting with my uncles and aunties, and one of them was like, look, if you want to have impact, go join the Gates Foundation. That's a good place to work. 
Another auntie said, look, I do plenty of volunteering on the side. Why don't you do that and get yourself a proper job? <laughs> by many measures of by soci from society, I wasn't conforming to these measures of success. I was choosing a path that didn't make logical sense to the world around me. Now, it was hard to make that step. It's hard to walk down this ladder to move it to a new building, one for me that was unknown, one for me that I'd never seen others climb up, and to start again at the very bottom. But it was one that I had to do. And so that leaves me thinking, um, now that we're here in the business school, what does success look like for us? I've noticed that it's so easy to keep climbing and following these default measures, and it's very hard to often stop and ask these hard questions. Often it's a jolting experience that makes us ask these questions in the first place. For me, it was that 24-hour workday. But in this environment, it's easy to get swept into these constant measures that are given to us from people around us. I noticed it happened again right here in the business school. It's not like you move your ladder once and it stays. I spent two terms of my MBA year pursuing what I thought I should be doing. I spent two terms trying to understand how to shift big business from the inside, because I thought that's where I would have the most impact. It was only two weeks ago that I realized this isn't really what I want to do. And that was really unsettling. Many of us might have applied for that dream job that we thought we should do and then maybe not got it and realized, look, what is it that I really want to do with my life? But I think it's exciting because in this time of transition and this time of uncertainty, I think it's the best moment to begin to really ask these hard questions. In these moments of transition, I think we need to have a lot of courage to be brutally honest with ourselves. I've noticed my mind is capable of convincing me to do things I don't want to do. And we need to be honest to see through this, to ask the hard questions and to choose the path that doesn't conform with what society is telling us to do. I've noticed for me in this time, at this point, it probably means going back to New Zealand, starting a business that I've been too scared to do for the last two years and having the courage to leap into that. And I question for all of us at this point in transition, whether you're in the MBA, whether you're in a business, how can we keep questioning and keep being conscious about the path we're on? So we do consciously, intentionally, don't just get shaped by the system, but be on the path that really matters to us. So I think that's the first half, right? Like being conscious of how the system is shaping us and being conscious about the path we're choosing. But the second half, I think, is even more exciting. What if we could rewrite the rules of the system, the incentives, the structures, the stories, so that even if we were blindly and unconsciously climbing this ladder in the way I was, we'd get to the top and realize, damn, I'm exactly where I want to be. I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm thriving. What if that was the kind of society we lived in? A couple of weeks ago, my circular economy class here was asked and challenged to live plastic free for just a day. And a week later, we were reflecting and we realized, look, it's really, really hard to do this. If I walk into a supermarket, everything around me is wrapped in plastic and wrapped in packaging. How do I do this? What if we could redesign the system such that when you walk into that supermarket, the easy, the simple, the cheap thing to do is to live plastic or waste free. That's the kind of system I want to see. And I think the economics of mutuality is exciting because it's giving us the tools to do just this. We've been hearing multiple times today the value of accounting for natural, social, as well as financial capital. By doing this, we can still try and maximize value on our balance sheets and income statements, but know that in doing so, we're also creating value for people and planet. We heard from Bharati earlier today how Unilever is incorporating sustainability metrics into KPIs. By doing so, our employees are incentivized to act in a way that maximizes again value for people and the bottom line and planet. We've heard multiple examples throughout the day of different ways businesses are rethinking themselves. Colin, Professor Colin just now was sharing about how the very purpose of business shouldn't just be to, to produce profits, but rather to solve problems in a way uh, that generates profits as a byproduct. I think we're at an exciting time to rewrite these rules and to change the norms. It's crazy to think that many of us here doing the MBA only have three or four weeks left. Um, I hate to say it, but it still blows my mind to think that we're here at the University of Oxford, the world's top university. And we've been here for like six months. Even those that are here for the conference, what a privilege to be here. Most of us are about to get graduate degrees, assuming we pass. Uh, <laughs> many of us here probably have PhD degrees, I'm sure. The reality is we're so qualified when less than 7% of the world has any education at all. It's crazy. It's amazing to think of the amount of opportunities and privileges we've had the access to. We're at a place where we're, literally we can go and do anything. Whether we like it or not, we're part of the elite. We're part of the top 
And if not us, who is going to rewrite the rules? Who is going to change the game? I think at this point, as we look into our careers, as we think about going back into the businesses that we've left for a couple of days, it's so important that we have the courage to be honest with ourselves, the courage to fight the system, to change the norms, to change the rules, to not let the system shape us, but to consciously shape the system. And I encourage all of us to be the misfits and mavericks that pick up that ladder, that walk to the new building, that have the courage to pursue a new definition of success, and in the process, rewrite the rules so that others can do the same. Thank you. <laughs>
we fail in transforming business. And the same goes for social entrepreneurship. Mm. So my first takeaway is please resist the urge to, for those who, who labor yourselves like I did as social entrepreneurs, resist the urge to call yourself social entrepreneurs. Um, second thing is the mutual PL and, and the mutual balance sheet actually gives us the opportunity to do what soccer did, what football did uh, four decades ago. It, rather than creating a social impact space, another sport where, yes, let's distribute cards, let's use cards, let's protect our players and allow the other sports to be violent and unsustainable, let's transform business as football transformed football, right? Let's take care of our assets. Mm. My last takeaway is that I, I want you to think about social impact space as a movement, not as an exclusive playground where only social entrepreneurs are allowed to get in or social impact investors. I would like to see our core curriculum have more of social impact space, but not called that way, but embedded in business finance, in accounting, because I know professors care about that, and we would love to hear more about that. So uh, I'm sure that I don't want to be a social entrepreneur. I'd rather be a banker than a social entrepreneur. But I'd rather be a banker competing on terms of, the, how, how, do, how do you say, Colin? Uh, add natural, natural assets? natural uh, human assets and environment, net social assets, rather than, well, I'm the pretty boy doing a pretty work, not necessarily profitable. So, thank you. Okay, so neither Bruno nor I are going to even try to, to follow those presentations. Vitor and Shruti, thank you so much for that brilliant ending to that. We, we started the day by noting the problem of trust in business. And we heard how that was having serious impacts on us. And one of the questions that we heard from the audience today was that perhaps we can have too much trust in business. And that's absolutely right. So long as business is not trustworthy, then we shouldn't put our trust in business. And what we've been talking about today is how can business legitimately reclaim our trust? How can it become truly trustworthy? And what we've discussed is a way in which we believe one can credibly recreate that trustworthiness of business. So we've had a wonderful day. Thank you very much indeed to all of you in particular, all of you who have stuck it to the end. <laughs> it's great to have you with us. But I'd also in particular like to thank all of our speakers today, our keynote speakers, our panelists, our participants in the masterclasses, all of the companies who so generously have worked with us in putting together their case studies for today, and we'll be having many more fascinating case studies tomorrow. Thank you very much for having been with us today. And in particular, thank you very much to all of the student presenters. You are all absolutely brilliant. 
And I am actually just going to uh, pick out Shruti because she has worked throughout the last nine months approximately with us in terms of helping to put together this forum. And without her assistance and the assistance of everyone who worked with us, we would not have been able to have put together the forum that we're able to enjoy today. So it sounds as if this is the end, but let me just remind you, it's the end of the beginning. And tomorrow, we have, in many respects, the real culmination of the forum. Because what we're going to try and address tomorrow is the fact that these issues that we've been talking about are not only important for business and us, but are having a critical impact on our nations and politics around the world. And that business as a potential force for creating the common good has a remarkably important role in helping to address some of the malaise that is afflicting countries around the world in both the developed and developing world. So tomorrow is going to be a remarkable discussion and ending with a remarkable debate by you, the student body. So I very much look forward to seeing you all bright and early at 8.45 tomorrow morning. But to celebrate the fact that you've made it to the end, we've got a little reward for you. And that is outside, there is a company called AM Breweries that produces alcoholic tea. <laughs> you might think this is the British person's dream. <laughs> but what makes it even more remarkable is it's alcoholic tea produced from coffee leaves. Yes, you heard that correct, coffee. And in many respects, it epitomizes what we've been talking about today. Because not only is it financially very successful, it's also environmentally very friendly. So it is very much a mutual company, exactly along the lines of what we're talking about. And what is more, the product tastes damn good. <laughs> To finish on a, on a high note, I would like to challenge the uh, culinary taste of my colleague and friend, Colin Mayer. But I suggest, yes, let's try to taste this <laughs> green tea <laughs> from coffee leaves, who looks like booze. <laughs> and I was thinking about one of the famous quotes we have in French. We said that the man who lives without folly is not as wise as he thinks. <laughs> so let's go and have a drink. Good. Thank you.